Hello, and welcome to Prairie Pulse. Coming up a little bit later in the show, we'll watch Concordia College uh, film professor Greg Carlson's uh, award-winning short film, A Perfect Record. But first, joining me now is Prairie Public's Inside Energy reporter, Amy Sis. Amy, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, glad to be here. Amy, as we get started, tell the folks a little bit about yourself and your background, maybe where you're originally from. Mm -hmm. So I'm originally from Seattle, um, and I've lived in North Dakota for about two years. Uh, I've been working for Prairie Public and Inside Energy since June of this year, and uh, before that I was a reporter for the Bismarck Tribune uh, covering education. Okay. Well, now, how did you become uh, the Inside Energy reporter for Prairie Public? So for a couple of years, I've had an interest in energy. It started when I was in college at the University of Montana. Um, I was working for a publication that my journalism school produced, and I took a trip out to the Bakken, uh, to Sydney, Montana, to follow around a uh, local reporter in Sydney and write about how her life was affected by the oil boom and the stories that she covered. And I was hooked. Um, I was just absolutely fascinated by, by the Bakken. And so uh, two summers later, I uh, returned to the Bakken uh, to the weekly title a Tribune newspaper um, and I was an intern there covering all things oil and all of the impacts of the oil boom and then uh, after I graduated college I took an internship with Politico uh, the news organization in Washington DC that covers all things politics and I was uh, working for their energy team covering uh, federal energy policy and state energy policy from more of a national perspective uh, so I had this deep interest in, in energy which is uh, what prompted me to want to move back to North Dakota to work at the Bismarck Tribune um, in a state where everything was booming and uh, this job opened up and I wanted to take on the challenge. Mm -hmm. So what exactly is Inside Energy? I understand it's a it's a project that uh, started a couple of years ago so tell us about that. Who's Who all is involved and what, what's it focusing on? So Inside Energy, it's a public media collaboration between the public media organizations. Um, it started in several states, in uh, North Dakota, in Wyoming, and in Colorado. Um, and so each of those states has uh, its uh, own um, reporters that are working for the local public media organizations, like me here at Prairie Public, uh, covering specifically energy. And so our stories air on those public media stations in all of those different states, and we're expanding too to other states around the country. Okay. Uh, you've been pretty busy lately, I think. Uh, I have. Uh, especially with uh, the, the Dakota Access Pipeline. Can, can you tell us, uh, you know, sort of objectively, uh, what they tell the viewers what the issues are there? Mm -hmm. So the Dakota Access Pipeline really became big news in our state um, back in, I would say, around August when um, folks from all over the country, um, many Native Americans from tribes all over, as well as uh, non-Native Amer uh, people who are not Native American but who uh, want to maybe end fossil fuels, um, decided to come to North Dakota to set up these camps in protest of the Dakota Access Pipeline. And those camps, um, since August, have really grown in size up to, at times, several thousand people. Um, you know, the tribe, the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe, which is sort of leading the fight against this pipeline, is very concerned that if the pipeline goes through, a potential spill um, would contaminate its drinking water because it draws its water from the Missouri River, um, and the pipeline slated to cross under the Missouri. And the tribe's also concerned that some of its sacred sites in the area um, might be, uh, are, are being destroyed by construction of the pipeline. Um, then you have, you know, the oil industry in North Dakota, which for, um, you know, as the oil boom took off back in 2008, we didn't have a lot of pipeline infrastructure to carry oil outside of North Dakota, so we relied a lot on trains. Um, over time, we've added more pipeline infrastructure, um, and, you know, pipeline uh, safety experts argue that pipelines are safer, a safer route of transportation than trains uh, to, to carry oil. Um, this project would be the biggest pipeline that we have in our state. It has the capacity to carry about half of North Dakota's daily crude output out of state to market. And so it's something the oil industry really wants to uh, see happen. Mm -hmm. And I know over time, of course, we've had derailments here and, and they've tried to improve the, the, the uh, structure of the containers on, on the trains. Uh, so pipelines is a more efficient and 
maybe safer way to do it? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, um, that's when you tend to talk to folks in the oil industry, they'll tell you that yes, pipelines are a safer route. You know, when an uh, oil train crashes, there's a risk of a big explosion, and sometimes that can be deadly, you know. Um, and uh, pipelines, they, they can leak, and there's a lot of problems that come with that, but they tend to be uh, less deadly when they when they do leak. Okay. Well, have you been able to ascertain if, if uh, notice was given ahead of time in permitting the project and getting Native American officials involved? Mm -hmm. So that's this is kind of this issue that's at the heart of uh, the debate over this pipeline is you know the tribe is the tribe was the tribe consulted, and it depends who you ask um, the level of consultation. Uh, you know the pipeline company and the Army Corps of Engineers, which is the federal agency that has some jurisdiction over this pipeline and the waterway crossing, uh, will tell you that yes, we did consult with the tribe. We reached out to them you know numerous times. Um, the tribe, however, will tell you that that wasn't meaningful consultation. Uh, what the, the tribe want, wanted to see was that they would have some sort of consent and say over whether this pipeline is going to cross you know, next to the reservation. Um, and that, you know, in the end, the final plan for the pipeline would reflect some of the tribe's concerns. Okay. Well, obviously, this has received national uh, recognition, but what's the situation down uh, like down there right now? And have, have really the out-of-state visitors and celebrities, have they impacted the situation uh, more so than, uh, than not? <laughs> Yeah, so there's um, several celebrities that jump to mind that have uh, really helped to elevate this fight. Um, one being the actor Mark Ruffalo. There's another actress named Shailene Woodley who's uh, been uh, with the protesters for quite a while, um, trying to raise awareness about this issue. Um, you know, some of these uh, folks have spoken on national. Some of the celebrities have spoken on uh, national. Uh, uh, TV news networks about the issue or even on late night talk shows about the issue trying to, to elevate that. But I think that really social media has played a huge role in spreading awareness about what is um, happening with the Dakota Access Pipeline. And, you know, there's uh, videos that I think folks on Facebook have seen all over the country, um, you know, of some of the protests that have happened and the confrontations between police and protesters, images that have been shared all around the world. Uh, and so a lot of folks are, are very aware of what's going on here. Well, you know, this is, how long do you think the protests and the situation may go on? Will it go deep into the winter or not, in you know, your opinion? The protesters have vowed to stay here until the end. Now, uh, it's November, and November is typically the month in North Dakota where the temperature really starts to drop. And so uh, the camps are winterizing. Um, there's actually, if you travel down there right now, you'll see yurts um, that have been built and uh, teepees uh, that they're trying to, to insulate to get ready for the winter so that people can stay there uh, to continue to uh, fight and oppose this pipeline. Um, you know, I'm not sure whether some of the, num uh, the number of protesters might drop off when it does get to be quite a bit colder, but right now there's still at least hundreds of folks there, if not over a thousand. Well, of course, there have been situations. Uh, uh, how, are you having any trouble getting access as a reporter? Because I know reporters have had issues down uh, on the pipeline also. Mm -hmm. It's been really an interesting experience for reporters trying to cover the subject. Um, when I first went down to these protest camps um, back in August, I just walked right in, I walked around, I interviewed you know whoever I saw that wanted to talk to me, I recorded anything, I took pictures of everything. Now when you go down to these protest camps, um, the operation down there has become much more sophisticated and so there's actually a media tent at the main camp that's been set up. Up. And when you enter the camp, there's a, a security um, officer to uh, that uh, the protesters have kind of appointed to um, that will direct you um, as a member of the media up to this media tent. You have to um, get a press pass um, from the media tent in order to access the camps. And we'll sit you through a presentation where you listen to um, a number of rules and things that they prefer that you not um, record, such as ceremonies and prayers that are going on that are you know um, uh, sacred to. Uh, to the folks there. And uh, if, you know, I've not had any issues with getting kicked out of the camps, but I know some reporters have. Um, you know, if somebody sees them doing something they don't like, they'll uh, revoke their access. Hmm, okay. Well, you know, with all you've seen and done down there, do you see a settlement on the horizon or uh, do you think this is going to go on for a while? 
I think this is going to go on for a while. Um, you know, one of a couple of outcomes could happen. Uh, we're waiting on the, the Corps of Engineers um, to decide whether or not it wants to issue this final permit, this final easement that is needed to cross under the Missouri River. And um, the Corps doesn't, hasn't necessarily set a timeline for when it's going to make that decision. Um, now, what President Obama um, came out uh, several weeks ago and said that the Corps is actually looking at options to reroute the pipeline. Um, so that's potentially something that could happen. Um, and then you have the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe, which has sued the Corps over uh, this, this pipeline and this river crossing. And that lawsuit is still playing out in court right now. So we'll have to see what happens. Okay. Well, while this issue has taken up a lot of your time for Prairie Public, what are some of the other stories that you're covering? Mm -hmm. So I've certainly done a lot of coverage of the Dakota Access Pipeline um, since that's been such big news the past mm -hmm. few months. But um, one of the first stories I did, I took a look at the coal industry and uh, particularly the lignite industry here in North Dakota um, and some of the uh, unique challenges that it faces. Um, and so... Uh, one thing, uh, the, the lignite industry here um, operates a bit differently than uh, the coal industry in the rest of the country because lignite can't be transported long distances by train um, because it's a very, uh, it's a very uh, dense, heavy, um, or it's a, it's a very dense, heavy coal. And uh, so... Uh, North Dakota, we don't face these big transportation costs um, associated with uh, with coal and burning coal that other states might face, which is a, a challenge for uh, power uh, utilities in other states that are, um, you know, having to look at alternatives maybe to coal as uh, that plays out. Mm. Okay. Uh, what's been the reaction so far from state officials and, you know, any pushback uh, from officials when you're out doing energy related stories? Mm -hmm. You know, I've not faced a lot of pushback yet, but I'll tell you it was interesting. Um, uh, I want to say in October, I was up at this uh, North Dakota Petroleum Council annual meeting in Minot, and I wanted to talk to a lot of folks there in the industry about the Dakota Access Pipeline um, to gather their thoughts. And I did find people who wanted to go on the record with me and talk about the importance of having pipelines, but I also encountered a lot of folks there who um, didn't want to talk to me about it because it was such a touchy subject. Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, you know, it doesn't seem like energy and oil were, were much of a, a big story during uh, sort of the recent election, mm -hmm. uh, either statewide or presidential. So why do you think that was? Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's a really good question. Um, you know, and I'm not, I think there's just a lot of other issues that are on voters' minds, um, especially nationwide, and on the, the candidates' minds as well. You know, whether that's immigration, whether that's income inequality, um, energy just isn't this hot button issue on the top of the, the, the candidates' plates. That's not to say that the candidates uh, didn't have, um, you know, strong stances on energy. Uh, but it just, yeah, wasn't a, a hot button issue. Okay. Well, have there been any surprises uh, you've experienced since you uh, came to Prairie Public uh, in your travels around the state? Mm -hmm. You know, I think the Dakota Access Pipeline, seeing this evolve into this huge national story, um, has really been interesting to watch and it's been interesting for me personally because I just made the switch over from print journalism to broadcast journalism. I did one story about the uh, coal industry in North Dakota and then the second story I did was about the Dakota Access Pipeline and that not only aired on Prairie Public and the Inside Energy Stations but on NPR and a lot of the stories I've done since um, have you know aired nationally and so that's been quite a challenge for me having to learn the ropes of broadcast journalism well also trying to provide content locally and nationally. Okay. What are you hearing when you're out there from state officials as to why the cuts had to be made at the, at the state level considering, uh, you know, there was so much money flowing into the state in, in the last few years? Mm -hmm. Well, as the uh, oil industry really boomed, the state, you know, took in quite a bit of uh, revenue um, from, from oil. And then as we've seen over the course of the past two years, the price of oil drop and the level of activity in oil production drop out in the Bakken we've uh, seen the amount of revenue that the state collects drop. And so as a result, you know, you have to issue budget cuts. Okay. Uh, you know, what about uh, the forecast 
uh, for when oil prices might get at a level and when drilling might pick back up? It's kind of anybody's guess. Um, so right now, the price of oil has been hovering around 50%, or no, sorry, not 50%, $50 per barrel. And uh, the oil industry would really like to see the price stay above $50 per, per barrel for an extended period of time, you know, at least a couple of months to really start that, start uh, to have drilling pick back up again. And, uh, you know, $60 or $70 would really be more ideal. Mm -hmm. So what is it like for producing for TV stories and radio stories? Are they, is it different as you uh, do those? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is a bit different. So with uh, TV stories, you um, are able to tell the story visually and you're, uh, you write your story, but you, you, the audience is also seeing the story in front of them. For radio, um, it's it's quite different. The audience has no picture in front of them, so you have to paint that picture for them. And you do that via the words that you say and the emphasis that you put into your voice and also the, um, the sounds that you capture to help tell the story. Yeah. So in all your stories, are can they be found uh, on the web? Mm -hmm. Yes. So all of my stories are available um, on Prairie Public's website, prairiepublic.org, as well as on Inside Energy's website, which is insideenergy.org. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, what what do you think some of the key energy issues are? Uh, uh, are going to be looming uh, as this uh, legis new legislative session starts? Mm -hmm. I think we're going to see um, some sort of fallout from the Dakota Access Pipeline um, because that's been such a huge issue that's you know gobbled up quite a bit of state resources um, in terms of funding uh, law enforcement's efforts to uh, uh, deal with the protest. And so we're going to see uh, some sort of fallout from that. Yeah. So what's the best part of your job? The best part of my job, um, you know, is waking up and turning on the radio each morning and uh, hearing stories that I do. Um, that's kind of a new concept for me. It used to be I'd pick up the newspaper and, uh, you know, uh, see my byline. But it's uh, fun to, to hear myself on the radio and uh, share the, the voices of the people that I, I meet and I interview and uh, let the rest of the world uh, hear what they have to say. Do you have any stories in the pipeline, so to speak? <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, the Inside Energy, we're actually working on a uh, TV uh, documentary about the Dakota Access Pipeline and some of the sovereignty and tribal issues that that raises. So I'll be working on that over the coming weeks. Okay. Well, if people want more information or they want to find your stories, again, remind them, where can they go? Who can they contact? Mm -hmm. Yes, they can go to um, insideenergy.org, um, and you can also find them on Prairie Public's website at Prairie public.org. Okay. Well, Amy, thanks so much for joining us mm -hmm. today. Thank you. Stay tuned for more. A Perfect Record was made as part of the Fusion International Documentary Challenges annual competition. Producers and Fargo filmmakers Greg Carlson, Tucker Lucas, and their team were selected for the third year in a row as a top 12 finalist. The world premiere of this short film was held at the Slam Dance Film Festival in Park City, Utah in January. Enjoy this unique look at a vinyl record collector. If you give me a box with 10 records I know and five records I don't know, even if they're the 10 most favorite records I ever had, I'm into those five I don't know first. You know, there's certain collectors I think that are completists and they love a certain artist and they want everything they can get by that artist. And for me it always went back to wanting to know that next thing. I joke with people that I'm looking for nothing and everything at the same time. My name is Dean Syme and I'm a record collector. I like the interaction, kind of committing to having to listen. You know, you've got 20 minutes on a side of a record roughly and you've got to pay attention to it. I've compared to driving a stick shift car a lot of the times where you have to pay attention to what you're doing. You can't just put it on and ignore it. So you've got to pick up the needle, you've got to set it on the record, you've got to listen to it and pay attention, know when it gets to the end to take it off. And I like flipping over the record, I like handling the records. That's just something I miss when I've used digital music. It's You miss that interaction with the, the music. So here's a record I picked up a few months ago and I bought it originally because of the artwork. I like how the family doesn't look very happy and it says don't settle for uptight stereo. And you open it up and it's got this great pop-up and it shows the family hanging out at night 
listening to music, they've got records out. And then as a bonus, the record was even orange. My name is Lori West and I am a librarian. One night I was at the library and I was just getting into my car and he came out of the library. He had like a mullet. <laughs> But he was really cute and he had a jean jacket he wore and there was a suburbs patch on it, which I zeroed in on right away. She saw the patch in my jacket and we both kind of liked the same band a little bit. And I walked up to him and I said, I want to know your name, which is totally uncharacteristic for me. She was the first girl I had met that had similar interest in music and cared about music the way I do. That was a big connection that I, I felt with her anyway was, wow, here's a girl that likes music. But I know when we did move in together, I remember kind of her bringing her records in and me bringing my records in. And there were a few that we overlapped on. Um, there's a band called We've Got a Fuzz Box and We're Going to Use It. We both had a copy of that. I had the import, she had the domestic. My name is Oliver Syme. I'm a senior at Fargo North High School in Fargo, North Dakota. My name is Quincy Syme, and I'm a junior at Fargo North High School in Fargo, North Dakota. I remember always seeing all the records in the basement and all the like, CDs and 8-tracks and whatnot and always thinking it was normal that someone had this much music. The basement was always like the record storage area. It's kind of like one of the main purposes of the basement, I always thought. On one of my birthdays when I had a bunch of friends over and his like ginormous speakers got delivered and all my friends were super excited that the speakers were taller than them. Usually he like falls asleep or something like late at night when we're down here, but it doesn't bother us. I think he's done a good job of not affecting our decisions on music. They need to be able to develop their own taste. What means something to them and what resonates with them as people rather than looking at somebody else's generation for their music. I'm a very moody music listener. I mean, I've got thousands of records in my house and thousands of pieces of music in my house and I'll spend a whole morning not listening to anything looking for the right record to play at that moment. The one that always gets mentioned is Big Star, and a friend of mine jokes that I've never heard you talk to anybody about music without bringing up Big Star. I love the first couple Cars records, and every time I listen to them, it takes me right back to being 15, 16 years old. This is an album by a band called the Jody Grind, the first Lloyd Cole and the Commotions record was which came out in 84. So you're looking at going on 30 plus years of that record probably being played in my house on almost a monthly basis. Bands like NRBQ and The Kinks, Dr. Feelgood, how did I miss this band for 30 years? I love Conway Twitty, which freaks people out. John Prine wrote the song, Will Oldham did a version of it, but they do In Spite of Ourselves. This is a double 10 inch of cover songs, but this one's got like Dark Into the Street on it, Fortunate Son. I actually compare to some of the old blues artists. She might not be a superstar right now, but she's gonna be remembered for a very long time. It's a lot of love songs. It's great pop music. They were from the Pacific Northwest before anybody else was, it seems like. Oh, I, I can't forget about this one. This is much more traditional country sounding than a lot of it. The Modern Lover's first album, I've said before, it's like the perfect rock and roll record. A friend of mine talked me into going to New York to visit him, and one of his big pushes for me was the WFME Record Fair. He goes, you gotta come see this thing, it's crazy. I just thought it was great. It was a full day of just shopping for records, and I'm like, I should do something like that in Fargo. So when I got back, I started kind of contacting a few of the people I knew that had music collections. I was convinced there was gonna be three vendors and two shoppers on the first year, but it turned out to be a lot bigger than that. And here's six years later, 40 tables of vendors selling stuff and hundreds of people showing up to look through them. It was never really about the guy that had a store, the guys that were selling their records on eBay. It was really about the guy that had a lot of records in college and now they're taking up room in his basement. And how do you move them on to other people? How do you get the kids? If they discover Built to Spill and they like records, well, if you've got a guy that's 45 and has a Built to Spill record and doesn't use it, maybe a kid that's 20 should have that record and use it. You know, I'm a music promoter in that sense. Whether I worked in the record store, I did radio, I did a couple zines, and now I'm doing the record fair, and it's always about, I want people to enjoy the music. If I didn't really sell a record all day, I'd be fine.
Well, that's all we have on Prairie Post this week. And as always, thanks for watching. Funding provided by the members of Prairie Public.